and minimalists. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I am Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the Minimalists. Welcome to episode 170. We're back, baby. Indeed. We took February off well, oh, from, from this main feed. Yeah. We accomplished all of our dreams. <laughs> my back healed up. A little bit. A I little mean, bit. oh my goodness. You're still you're, you're seated today. Yeah. And some of my problems have healed. I've, I've learned more about my, my gut issues. Maybe we'll talk about that today on the Maximal episode, but we've got some questions we need to dive into. Our first question, oh, by the way, today we're talking about subtraction. Yeah. It's almost spring, Ryan, and <laughs> spring cleaning is in the air. Uh, it's, it's funny, like, even for me, even now as a minimalist, spring cleaning is something that it's that time where it's like, oh, the beginning of the year, you start thinking about the mm. stuff. Beginning of a month, you might think about the 30-day minimalism game. But for spring, it because there is that, that sort of societal expectation of spring cleaning that's become a meme. Yeah. And so we're going to talk about subtraction today. And that might mean subtraction of stuff, but it also might mean subtraction of habits or relationships and some other things we're going to talk about today. Our first voicemail is from Kelly in Illinois. I'm a big talker. I'm also a huge introvert, but I kind of wanted to know how to talk less and be more of a listener. Um, regardless if it be having a normal conversation, telling a story, or even asking questions, I tend to talk way too much, and I would like to kind of simplify and keep my words sh short and sweet and simple. But it's really difficult for me to do that because I love to talk so much, and that's probably just part of my personality. So I just wanted to know how I can add minimalism to when I talk to people. Man, Ryan. Uh, so, so Kelly, this is a good question because it's not one we get that often, but it's such an important question. Sure, I think. Yeah, she said some things that really stood out to me in her question itself. Yeah, sometimes what the question doesn't say reveals more about the question. You know what I'm saying? I think so. Yeah. She said, "I have two quick questions for you guys." <laughs> and there was just, <laughs> and then there was one question. Yeah. <laughs> like she was, she's anticipating speaking more, right? Mm. And that—that's her thing. She's like, "I'm anticipating." a book when all I really need to put out there is a blog post or an yeah, essay or a right? tweet or a tweet. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes 140 characters can be far more meaningful. What's the, uh, uh, uh who, who, who was it? Uh, Mark Twain, right? Podcast Sean, I'm looking over podcast Sean. He said, I'm sorry, this letter is so long. I didn't have time to make it shorter. Mm -hmm. And in her question, she said some things here. I'm a big talker, but I'm also a huge introvert. I didn't think that was possible. I, well, here's the thing. I, I don't think she's necessarily an introvert, maybe. And I don't know. If you've done the Myers-Briggs, maybe you are. Mm -hmm. But introversion, extroversion is a spectrum. Now, you and I, I'm extreme introvert. Mm -hmm. You're extreme extrovert. Mm -hmm. That just means that's where we get our energy from it's from either being alone get recharged you get recharged from being around other people mm -hmm. uh, however that doesn't say anything about social competence yeah i can be around people just fine in the sense that i, I can interact with them however there are some extroverts that i know they need to be around other people. That's how they get charged, but they're not that socially competent. Yeah. My former spouse was uh, another form of that. She's very shy. She's a, a pretty extreme extrovert, but yeah. you, you remember Carrie. She's pretty shy around people that she doesn't know. And I think maybe Kelly's in the situation now where maybe she's not an extreme introvert. Maybe she's an extrovert and yeah. she's just shy around other people. It's possible. Man, I mean, I, I know for me, it's uh, it's hard for me to like not interrupt people and it's hard for me to like keep up with the conversation sometimes. And it, it, it for me, I guess, applying minimalism to those conversations and to those social interactions, uh, I think about how, you know, what it takes to be a good listener. Um, I, the biggest piece of advice I've ever gotten about being a good listener is not thinking about the next thing you're going to say. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, it was my aunt, this was a few years ago. And we were talking and, and I was expressing this to her. I'm like, man, I really wish that I, I could be a better listener. I just, you know, I don't know, know what it is. Like I try to pay attention. She was like, Ryan, I think like you always got this look in your eyes. Like you're always thinking of the next thing you're going to say. And you're like, shut up. Hold on a second. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. It, but she's absolutely right. And, and that's, that's just one small thing, but also um, mirroring. So like repeating things back to people. Cause really when you're having those social interactions, man, what do people want? They want to be understood. They, they want to know that you are respecting them, that you are respecting their preferences. And the way you can do that is, is by mirroring, by being a good listener, 
But I would say too, Kelly, when you talk a lot, do people complain about it? Because maybe maybe people like hearing her talk, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's, it reminds me of something. I remember we were sitting with with Patrick Roan mm -hmm. uh, in Minneapolis at a coffee shop and several of our friends were there and it's one of those situations I really enjoy Patrick he was on one of our, our uh, podcast episodes back in the 80s I think it was number 84 um, <laughs> I was thinking like the 1980s I'm no, like wait what <laughs> yeah back in, when we were doing this podcast on a cassette recorder in the right. 80s back on Warren Street no um and I, what I realized with someone like him is I enjoy listening to him more than I do participating mm. in the absolutely uh, the, the talking right because I, I feel like I'm he's not that much older than us mm -hmm. but like he has this sort of empirical wisdom that he has gained from a different life from ours mm -hmm. and through me I feel like I can almost soak that in via osmosis the key there is then what find out what serves the greater good the most yeah and in that scenario it's like me listening is serving a lot more than me interjecting yeah and then sometimes when you and i do events if we do like a little vip event beforehand there's like 50 people out of the thousand people who show up they do that little vip thing we're supposed to be talking 98 percent of that time right yeah and if we were just there listening to other people wander on a bit I don't think that would serve the greater good for the audience. It might help that one person out of the 50, but mm -hmm. for the 50 who are there, it makes more sense for us to be the, the Patrick Roan of that situation. Yeah, so what you're saying is Kelly needs to really look at what is appropriate within the conversation. Sometimes it's totally appropriate to ramble and, and maybe you need to vent and maybe you've got a friend who you can vent to and that's totally appropriate. But yes, sometimes we need to, uh, we do need to just, you know, kind of stop and, and listen. And I think it's a push in the pull in that in that stopping and listening but then also pulling the conversation uh, forward mm -hmm. through through your own through through your own dialogue yeah. and for me I'm, I'm thinking back to the most meaningful conversations that i've had it's it's never the uh ones that i anticipate are going to be the most meaningful right it's I, I had in fact i had coffee with jamie kilstein last week do you know jamie kilstein no. he is a comedian um he's been on a bunch of like shows and stuff some tweet us right yeah yeah absolutely yeah, yeah he, he was saying something to you like uh, i was talking to him that you always wanted to do stand-up comedy yeah. um <laughs> but uh he's and he's actually helping some folks work on some stand-up comedy he's a really well-known uh comic but he had some pretty significant life changes over the last few years he was sort of excoriated online in this particular community he was in i won't go into the details you can listen to the the conversation he did with joe rogan sean if you can put a link to that in the show notes um but anyway, I was having a conversation, and what I was realizing, I was learning stuff from him, mm -hmm. but then he was also learning from me, mm. and and it was it was very similar to our relationship. It was symbiotic in a way, but also like mentor mentee, mm. and then those roles flip, and it's mm. mentor mentee. Just within the span of five minutes, yeah. I can be the mentor, and then five minutes later, I'm the mentee. And if you find those conversations. For me, that's the place from which I grow the most. When Absolutely. All of a sudden, you look up and you're like, oh my gosh, 90 minutes already got gone by and I know you have to leave because oh, I can't wait to continue this conversation. There are other conversations where it's like, we're only three minutes into this. It feels like three hours. <laughs> so how's the weather? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, the small talk. It's funny. I really try to not talk about the weather unless it's like really app. But uh, <laughs> but but to keep those conversations, like if you if you are having a conversation and you want to keep a conversation going, for me, like I will start to... Uh, just ask like some good probing questions about that other person because people again they like to share their preferences they like to share their values they like to uh, they like to add their two cents to things I mean I was talking to Colin the other day uh, a couple of days ago we had a phone call Colin Wright yeah we were just talking about um, yeah Colin Wright you know exile lifestyle he uh, he gave me a call uh, he's coming into town here in the next few weeks and it was one of those conversations where like you know we were just kind of planning on you know what we were gonna do when he was in town mm -hmm. and then an hour and a half later i'm like dude <laughs> i'm we're like we've been talking for an hour and a half we've got to like hang up but uh but i mean it was a really nice it was really nice dialogue we were just you know talking about different uh different issues or uh different perspectives um just different things that are impacting the world right now and it was it was a very meaningful conversation but but uh, I, I think that's what it comes down to is, Kelly, what is it, what is it that you can do to make the, the conversation most meaningful? And I think if you're focused there, I think if you're constantly asking that question, uh, you can get that, th this, this answer to your question of how do, you, how do you know when to talk less? How do you know when to talk more? 
I think uh, I'm just going to wrap up Kelly's question with uh, a few practical tips as well. So uh, the thing that has helped me in the past become a better listener, because I too struggle with listening and I'm, I'm not a world-class listener, but people often think I am because I do a few things. One is I pause, especially when I'm about to say and or but, any of those sort of conjunctions, because what am I trying to do there? I'm just trying to keep the sentence going. I, I didn't, uh, you and I were talking about this last week. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't sufficiently hammer home this point, so I'm going to batter you over the head with it three different ways now. Yeah. Instead of saying but or and, Mm -hmm. I just pause for a second. Mm -hmm. And then quite often that room, that space, creates the space for someone else to interject. Or sometimes it gives me enough space to have that dramatic pause and, and to keep going. Also, uh, when you're communicating with other people, realize there are two different types of communication. I talk about this in my, my How to Write Better writing class when you're writing. Uh, but it's the same for talking as well. There's expressive communication. It's uh, the, the things I do with my body, m m doing these body movements. It's mm -hmm. the, the facial expressions, etc. I'm trying to, to express something. But then what am I trying to communicate as well? So I'm mm. trying to communicate facts, expressions, or sort of the emotions. Good conversation contains both types of communication, expressive and communicative. Absolutely. And then finally, uh, our friend Nate Green, who was on the, pod the breakups episode of the podcast, he, uh, he had a friend who said, uh, who's really quiet most of the time, and Nate was, was sort of talking to him about this, you know, because he found that his friend was a good communicator, but he was very quiet. Mm. And his friend said this, he said, I speak only when it adds more value than silence. Yeah. And can you imagine aspiring toward that? Yeah. Because silence is valuable. Kelly, I'd love to send you a copy of our book, Essential. It's an essay collection with 150 different essays about intentional living, 12 different areas of intentional living, everything from stuff and minimalism to success and priorities. But there is a chapter in there about relationships as well and how we interact well with others. And I think you'll find value in that. Podcast, Sean, if you could reach out to Kelly, please send her the book version of that or the ebook version if you want. Or if you enjoy our podcast, you'll also like the audio book version of Essential Essays by the Minimalists. All right, Ryan, before we move on to our lightning round, it looks like we have uh, Sean has five more voicemail questions today. We're going to answer on our maximal episode this week on Patreon. Uh, I also want to talk to you about some personal stuff that, that happened to me that I think relates a little bit to Kelly's question we just we just answered as well. In the meantime, we'd love to hear what you have to say. So if you have a comment or tip about subtraction, leave us a voicemail, 406-219-7839, or email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. We'll air our favorite comments and tips on a future episode. And stay tuned to the end of this episode for this week's listener comments and tips. And here's a pro tip for you. Write down your question before you call in. It'll make things easier for everyone, especially for Podcast Sean. But you'll feel better about your question, too. Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It is time for our lightning round where we answer questions from social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at The Minimalists during the lightning round. This is where Ryan and I each do our best to answer every question with just a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We also put the text of these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. And now you can find all of our qu quotes in one place thanks to our good friend, Jessica Lynn Williams. Minimalmaxims.com is that place. All right, Ryan. Are we, are we ready for the first question? Let's do it. Let's do it. It is from Amy. Do you feel it's as important to let go of obligations in the form of family and friends who no longer serve you as it is to let go of stuff? Man, so my, I don't have a short answer for this. I don't have a pithy one, although I guess this is somewhat pithy, but it's not something I would tweet. But I think maybe that Amy is looking at this question, uh, looking at this topic, looking at the situation, uh, without the full view. Mm. And the thing I would say is if your expectation is to be served, that is a poor expectation. Now, every every relationship there, if you're removing a relationship from your life, it's not just because you aren't being served by it, but sometimes it might be because you can't serve the relationship. Yeah. And so I think the better question is, what can I give to this relationship? And then what am I getting after I figure out what I can what I can give without the full expectation of, of receiving? I totally understand. Well, my pithy answer is this. It's, it's pretty simple. Minimalism is a tool to help you say yes to that which is most important and meaningful. And what I mean by that is, is to look at 
uh, things that are or are not serving you. It's not a question of whether or not it's doing something for you. Really, is, is is it creating a meaningful experience? Is it helping you create a meaningful experience for yourself or for that other person? The the word that uh, stands out to me when you say that is the word well being, because uh, when I think about about the things I have in my life or the the relationships in my life. Does it add to my overall well-being? Mm-hmm. And if I'm just being served, I mean, think about that. You're served when you go to a all-inclusive resort. Yeah, you're just constantly, and, and it's it's great for a day or two days. But mm-hmm. if you were to do that for two years, you would feel infantilized, where yeah. everyone is just bringing you towels, and th- that's not meaningful. That mm-hmm. doesn't help your well-being long term. Yeah. And so, in order for something to help your well-being, maybe you need to be able to give to it, and then also be able to get something from that yeah man you gotta you gotta look at that us box all right next question is from the optimal roadmap how can i determine whether something is an obligation i often feel obligated to do a lot of things i shouldn't have to this is an important question the the obligation thing yeah you and i have had to remove some obligations from our plates mm-hmm. recently our, our collective plate because uh, you broke five vertebrae in your back and that's a problem yeah. and that made you lay up in bed for several weeks because <laughs> that's pretty much all you could do and with me and my, my gut issues of fungal overgrowth, bacterial overgrowth and that has uh, created some significant, you know, when your gut's broken, your brain's broken and so I've had some issues with depression because of that and, and realizing that those two things are connected, I also realized that, you know what? These are obligations that I might have to set down for a period of time. It's weird though, when we have obligations, the question to ask is like, who who told you you had to do this? Yeah, do you feel obligated? Uh huh. Or did you uh, overcommit yourself and you've made yourself obligated at this point? Right, and the thing is, who told you to do this? Usually it's, it's me who told me right. to do this, right? Well, my pithy answer is walking toward the right obligations allows us to leave behind obligations that don't serve us. So we talked about relationships and serving us, but here the, the, the obligations serving us, I think if, in order for it to be an obligation, it should serve us sure. in some way. Otherwise, um, you know, man, I... If you if you show me your calendar, I'll show you what your priorities are, right? right? If you look at my calendar, those are my my priorities. It's not what I say I do with the day, but those are also my obligations. So those better serve me. They better add to my well being. Other way, otherwise, they're just getting in the way of my well being. Absolutely. My pithy answer is this: being a minimalist doesn't free you from meaningful obligations. So I guess what I'm what I'm thinking about here is there are even some obligations I don't want to do, but I still have to do. We got to pay taxes. I mean, that's like the, you know, it's tax season. That's the one thing that stands out right now. I really wish we didn't have to get all the paperwork together. Even though we have a CPA, there's still a lot of prep work that goes into right. sending in that information to but get our taxes taken care of. Right? Absolutely. With, with the CPA. So, so you can I guess, what, what would you call that? Chipping away at an obligation, maybe? Like, yeah. if you can't remove the whole thing, how do you make it, yeah. uh, how do you remove some of the friction? Yeah, it's like a four-hour work week, work week approach. Yeah, yeah, Tim Ferriss approach. Totally agree. All right, let's move on to our added value portion of the show. Ryan, this is where we talk about the things that have added value to our lives recently. I wrote down the this sh- this show, Escape at Danamora, because it's hard to get me to finish a TV show, but that's not what I'm going to uh, talk about today. Uh, I'm calling an audible at the last moment. I've been listening to this album by a a guy named St. John. And I don't know how to describe it. It's like contemporary uh, hip-hop, R&B, but not really. It's Hmm. almost like a mixture of singer, songwriter, and hip-hop, and R&B. It's kind of like if you took The Weeknd or what Drake used to do and but evolve it to 2019. Interesting. It's I'll have to check it out. It's really good. His, it's his first album. It's called uh, Collection One. And in fact, Sean, maybe we can end this episode by playing them out with one of my favorite songs from that, which is called Selfish. It's, uh, man, it, it really it really resonates with a former version of, of myself. But uh, yeah, check that song out at the end of this. Ryan, what do you, what's happening so adding value funny. to your life? That reminds me, well, before I go to my added value, it reminds me of the Miko concert I just went to. She has so many songs about her consumption habits. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> and it just reminds me of like, you know, my, my days of yesteryear. Uh, I'm going to recommend The New Yorker Presents, man. This is on Amazon Prime. So uh, Amazon Prime, like it's convenient with the two-day shipping and 
I mean, in LA, you get like same day shipping sometime. Uh -huh. uh, you know, you get some discounts here, or there, yada, yada, yada. But I never really took advantage of the Prime Video right, right, right. That, that they have there because, you know, I'm usually going to Netflix if I want to watch something. But, dude, there's the, a show called The New Yorker Presents. And uh, to my surprise, uh, Rob Bell, he's in episode number eight. They did like a nice little like 10, 12 minute segment on his life and kind of his history. And it's just an approach uh, th that this the magazine takes you've got you've got satire uh -huh. you have some nonfiction you have some reality uh, it's a little bit of everything I highly recommend it yeah, Bex and I get our New Yorker usually on Fridays it shows up in the mail and we'll spend Saturday and Sunday just sort of flipping through and reading things to each other I really enjoy that so I'll take a look at the show as well let's move on to right here right now where we talk about what's going on in the lives of the minimalists so uh, home tour we have my home tour over at YouTube and Jordan tells me that thing is, is doing well. People are finding a lot of value in it, and, and that's good. It was about five minutes uh, long, but you get to see into our lives. Ella's there, and Bex is there, and you get to see some of Ella's toys, and uh, me doing pull-ups and all kinds of other things. Was it just me, or did you do like a million pull-ups? Well, that was on the, the Patreon episode. <laughs> we, we did an extended home tour on Patreon. It was so funny. And, <laughs> yeah, it was 239, I've been told. Um, yeah, well, great. <laughs> we'll talk about that more. That then. is interesting that someone sat there and counted it. It took me about 20 seconds to realize what what was happening. Because, <laughs> like, Jordan did such a good job of taking, like, you, three right, or four you, different so camera you, angles. You were really impressed for 20 seconds? <laughs> for, no, for 20 seconds, I was like, why why is this on Josh doing pull-ups so much? <laughs> and then I just realized it was on this loop, and I was like, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, but we did the full house tour. Uh, you can check it out. And I also talk about some of the rationale behind some of the things that we brought into our into our home. Ryan and I are working on a new book and a new film. And this is a bit of a teaser. I can't really talk a whole lot about it right now because we've set them on this plate that we're getting back to really soon. It's on our bread plate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gluten-free film. Gluten-free book, yes. Yeah, so... Um, Details coming on that, but if you're on our email list, you'll be the first to, to hear about that or we'll also talk about it on the podcast in the future. And then we're not doing any tour stops uh, uh, in the near future, but our friend Colin Wright, who you just mentioned, is going to be in LA. Yeah. So I'm going to give the intro at that talk on uh, March 16th. And I might even be at his Minneapolis tour stop this summer because Bex does uh, 4th of July in uh, in Minneapolis where, where her family is. So if that, co if that corresponds with me being out there but you can find details to that here's here's what i'll say the la event i think it's only 120 seats so as soon as you're oh. hearing this if you want to go to that i don't make any money from telling you this but i really support colin yeah. go to it just becoming tour.com that will sell out as soon as we mention it at? it's in hollywood okay yeah so it's uh, the met theater i think it's called okay. but uh all the information is at becoming tour.com he's doing 26 cities in total so you can check him out he's talking about minimalism and things but also uh learning you know his podcast is called let's know things and ryan this week we have five more questions about subtracting certain awesome. relationships from our lives about letting go of sentimental items about minimalism for parents grandparents and teens i think those were two or three different questions and then about simplicity for artists visual artists in particular here but we'll just talk about simplicity for artists and more if you want to hear our answers to those questions you can listen to this week's maximal episode available exclusively on patreon that's right you're currently listening to our weekly minimal episode but each week ryan and i record an entirely different long form maximal episode on the minimalists private podcast which gives us the private space we need to talk about our flawed habits our family lives our struggles our relationships our emotions and our insecurities without fear of judgment or public ridicule also ryan um I think Bex and I had our first fight this week in four years. <laughs> wow. And so I want to talk about that a little bit as well because I learned I learned some stuff, mm. uh, maybe about subtracting some emotions or some expectations from something. So Wait, you have emotions? <laughs> well. <laughs> what, wait a minute. Who are you? What have you done with Josh Milburn? <laughs> no, I subtracted her emotions. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's all fine now that we've gotten rid of her emotions. They were removed surgically. <laughs> no, uh, but yeah, uh, so... so um, well, Patreon is also the best way for us to fund this podcast. Keep it 100% advertisement free. So when you subscribe to the Minimalist Private Podcast on Patreon, you'll also receive a personal link to our maximal episodes so that they play in your favorite podcast app. You'll also get access to our entire back catalog of more than 100 
private podcast episodes. Find all the details and all the good stuff and including an additional podcast episode every week over at theminimalists.com slash support. Ryan, what else you got for us? As always, I just want to encourage people to read more and get informed. And now here are some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Hello, this is Tina from Kansas. I'm calling in response to the person who wrote into Patreon about their kids wanting name brand clothes, Nike shirts and shoes and stuff like that. And I wanted to share what I do with my kids. I kind of try to follow the Dave Ramsey method. I have two kids in junior high right now um, in elementary school. They could care less about name brands. And in middle school, they're very concerned about it. And as a high school teacher, they tend to care less about it again. But um, there's something about junior high. Anyway, I don't want to deprive them of that, but I also can't afford it. So what I do is explain the value of a dollar to them. I tell them how much I make, how much dad makes, how much minimum wages per hour, what our mortgage is, you know, that it costs money to flush the toilet and buy food and turn on the lights and all of those things, trying to break it down for them so they can kind of see the big picture of why it's silly to spend $50 on a t-shirt for a kid that's going to grow out of it. So I have them work for it, just like Dave Ramsey said. Instead of giving them an allowance, like at the end of the week or whatever, it's important to pay them immediately. So I have $1 bills um, stashed in my house. And if I need something done and I don't want to do it, vacuuming the floor or shovel the driveway. Um, you know, I tell them I'll give them five bucks to shovel the driveway and they'll have to do it 10 times if they want to get enough money saved up to buy a $50 t-shirt, but that's up to them. And then they usually say, nah, forget it. (laughs) Thanks. Hey guys, it's Leah from Portland, Oregon. I just wanted to share something that I've been kind of noticing um, just with a lot of clothes that people own. Um, It's what I call the laundry challenge. So many of us have enough clothes to get through probably multiple months without doing laundry, but then it comes down to certain objects that force us to do laundry. You know, you run out of pants or you run out of socks. Um, So I've been just kind of trying to see how long I can go without doing laundry. And it kind of forces you to try out clothes that you normally wouldn't um, in your closet since we often end up just wearing the same things. So that kind of gives you a chance to one, use the stuff that you have been just kind of letting sit around and two, kind of gives you a chance to see, is this something that I really want to hold on to? Do I like this? Do I want to use this more? Or is it something that I just need to let go of and give away? Um, And then it also makes us realize the things that maybe we need. So maybe we're kind of seeing a sweater that we want to buy, but we really don't need it. What we need is more socks and underwear to get through um, another week of laundry um, to kind of conserve water and conserve our time. Um, So that's why I've been noticing. I feel like I can get through, um, you know, about a week and a half and I'll reuse. I'm not really wearing that many jeans or sweaters since I tend to rewear stuff, but then I quickly run out of socks and underwear and essentials that you normally don't think of, but are actually super important. Um, another tip is I often reuse clothes, like I was saying earlier, like jeans and sweaters and tights, things that aren't necessarily dirty, or maybe you put it on for a second and then you change a couple hours later. And so I just kind of have like a soft cloth, uh, laundry bin that I put next to my actual hamper in my closet. And if I have a pair of jeans or a sweater that I just wore, and I know I'm probably going to wear it again before I wash it, um, I'll just throw it in that bin. And that way it's not just sitting on the floor, but then I don't have to put it in my hamper. It's one of those kind of in between where you don't want to wash it but you don't want to put it away because it's not really clean but it's not really dirty and I feel like it just kind of helps keep my space organized and kind of helps me know where all my clothes are and just oh I can just grab my favorite sweater and run out the door and it's all taken care of. Um, Another kind of clothing related tip um, is if you have a special occasion coming up, um, rentthe runway.com can be really helpful. 
I've had um, about seven weddings this year that I've had to go to and I don't feel like I need a new dress for every single occasion but I also feel like I don't want to wear the exact same dress to seven weddings um, especially because they're in different seasons and some are inside and outside but I also don't want to buy a million different outfits um, and spend hundreds of dollars um, so I'm looking to rent the runway. You can rent, um, you know, high quality designer clothes without actually purchasing them. So you're kind of decreasing the need for multiples of these dresses to be made and sold. Instead, you can just rent one in your size and return it when you're done. Um, and then someone else can go ahead and use it. All right. Bye. Hi, Ryan and Josh. This is Kim calling from Portland, Oregon. And I was just calling in regards to a question from a listener named Kimberly from the food episode a while back on organic vegetables and fruit at affordable prices. I just wanted to recommend Imperfect Produce to her. Um, it's available in certain areas, but it's growing with wildfires, so I suspect it'll be popping up in other cities. Um, they offer both organic and conventional produce that is ugly and won't be accepted by a grocery store, so it is much cheaper than buying the same vegetables and fruit at the local, local grocery store. By ugly, I mean it's usually just really big, really small, or it has some slight scarring, etc. The surface also helps to avoid food waste and puts money in local farmers' pockets for items that would normally go in the garbage. They deliver weekly or bi-weekly for a small fee, the low cost of the produce makes up for the delivery fee by far. I get a giant box of produce weekly for about $17, and if I purchase the same amount of food at the local grocery store, not Whole Foods, it would cost at least $50. I would highly recommend it if it is available in her area. I also donate five pounds of food to local shelters if you post a photo of your ugliest piece of produce that week on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, they have several cities listed on their website at imperfectproduce.com. Thank you. All right, y'all. That's it for now. You can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash theminimalists. And if you want our show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. Just enter your email address at the top. We'll never send you spam because that stuff's gross. But we will send you our show notes as well as our simple Sunday emails each week. And if you leave here today with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Oh, and by the way, here is St. John, his song, Selfish. Unless you're watching this on YouTube, then click on Ryan's face. Right here. We'll see y'all. The Minimalists.